all right you guys so we are going to be doing a recap today of the of the of the game played in round four the tata still masters between magnus carlson and jordan van forest all right so game starts out knight f3 by magnus jordan plays d5 now it is worth noting magnus in this event has been playing knight f3 and d4 c4 um he was not really doing this so much um uh prior to the world championship but ever since that world championship in november he's clearly been focused on on knight f3 and d4 setup so we have d5 g3 is played here jordan plays g6 now we have bishop g2 bishop g7 and magnus plays d4 it's worth noting that white can castle here but after e5 black gets a good grip on the center if you're looking for some sample games with this opening you should look at the games of wesley so in particular he's played the setup with a lot of success with g6 bishop g7 e5 and d5 here the d4 is played by magnus to prevent e5 and now additionally after knight f6 castles we transpose back into the grunfeld from a different order this is the fianchetto grunfeld here um now you will note that with the normally how you get to this order is something like knight f3 knight f6 c4 or actually not D c4 sorry you, go, you get like g3 g6 bishop g2 bishop g7 d4 castles castles and then d5 so this is the main order that this occurs in at any rate we get to this position after castles castles and now magnus plays c4 and here jordan plays c6 he takes c4 is the other main line here after dc4 knight a3 c3 b takes c3 c5 there are a lot of different games with the setup it's been played for many many years and it is generally considered solid for black but surely magnus had some ideas here so after c4 jordan plays c6 and now magnus plays b3 there is this random grandmaster hikaru nakamura who's played this queen b3 line many times with a lot of success but of course magnus doesn't want to follow a scrub like him so he chooses to play b3 here so here jordan has a really really interesting choice he chooses here to play bishop f5 um now as i was discussing with benjamin bach earlier when we were covering this game there is a very major line here with d takes c4 b takes c4 and black can play c5 here and after bishop b2 queen b6 queen b3 this is a very theoretical line there are a lot of different games that have been played here i think the evaluation is considered equal with perfect play no big surprise there um but jordan clearly didn't want this so instead jordan plays bishop f5 magnus goes bishop b2 jordan plays knight bd7 all pretty standard here trying to develop the queen side and e3 is played here by magnus and now jordan plays knight e4 again it's a little bit cramped here for black you can see that white has more space in the center here and also you don't really have pawn breaks e5 and c5 both are not playable here because e5 is over overprotected and also d c6 guards d5 so you don't really want to break this chain from b7 to c6 to d5 here so knight e4 is played and now knight to c3 is played by magnus knight takes knight bishop takes knight mag and jordan plays bishop e4 very logical move here the idea being that ideally in a perfect world let me make a random move like rook d8 white would love to move the knight to d2 guard c4 but also put a ton of pressure on this long diagonal from g2 to b7 but after bishop to e4 as you'll notice white cannot simply do this because if you go knight d2 black will just trade the bishops and now you no longer have threats along the diagonal without this very powerful bishop on g2 so here the way that you try to avoid that is you see this bishop on e4 it, it could be loose if you could move the knight so how do you try to dislodge this bishop and the way that you do that is in the long term you want to move the bishop to like h through f1 and then move the knight so queen e2 is played here by magnus logical move to develop e6 rook fd1 so this is step one of the plan here for magnus he puts the rook in the center again ideally you want the rooks on d1 and c1 primarily because the only ideas that black has here are pawn breaks with c5 or e5 so if i just make some random moves like rook e8 rook c1 you'll notice that after c5 you can always take and put pressure on d5 additionally you can also trade this way on d5 take on c5 and now your rooks are perfectly placed towards all the action on the c and the d files here so rook fd1 is step one of the plan now here jordan plays a5 which is a somewhat surprising move uh to me having seen gatulia kamsky also known as the famous effing legend who's played a lot of these setups with the with this pyramid here in the center of the board normally you try to set up with a6 and um, keep the center kind of a little bit a little bit closed here if you can rather than potentially creating a weakness on a5 so bishop to f1 is played here bishop takes f3 again magnus has a very simple plan bring the bishop away now you want to go knight d2 attack the bishop and then put put the bishop back on g2 say i play a random move like rook c8 knight d2 now you no longer can trade the light square bishops you have to go bishop f5 and after bishop g2 white has achieved the optimal setup with his bishop on g2 targeting the long diagonal 
and the black bishop on f5 being a little bit loose here. So bishop takes f3 is played by Jordan, and the reason behind this move is that Jordan tries to argue, sure, white has the two bishops, but the center of the board is very, very closed here, and additionally, black's knight can jump to e4 either via f6 or via c5. So queen takes f3, knight c5 is played here. Now here, Magnus goes to bishop e1. You do not take the knight on c5, because if you take the knight on c5, black can play bishop takes c3 here. And now after rook c1, black can simply play a move like bishop g7. And even though material is even, black has no weaknesses, very solid center here, and white cannot claim any advantage. So after knight c5, bishop to e1 is played by Magnus. Knight to e4 is played by Jordan, because obviously you don't want your knight to be captured for free. So knight e4, bishop to d3, and now Jordan plays f5. And here Jordan basically is, is arguing that because he has this pyramid of, of Giza here with these pawns from b7 to, to the knight on e4 and h7 to the knight on e4, that white can't really do a whole lot here. You'll notice that white can't really break. Um, if you trade on d5, I just take, so there's no break. You can't really push the pawns in the center. Pushing on the wing is maybe an idea with b4, but after takes and rook f7, black's pawns are still all connected very neatly here. And in this position, white, if anything, has a weakness on a2. So, so it's, it's a very logical setup by Jordan, and now it's on Magnus to kind of prove something. So here Magnus plays rook ac1. Again, logical move. Get the rook out of this diagonal. Additionally, get ready for action on the c file if there is any. So g5 is played here. Queen to e2. And now here Jordan plays a very interesting move. He plays this move pawn to g4. Now, one thing that you'll probably hear in other recaps is that, is that this move is a blunder and white should be much better. Now, during the actual game, when I was analyzing this with Benjamin Bach, who was on our channel here, we sort of, I, Benjamin thought that Jorn had made a blunder. I thought that, in fact, this was Jorn's plan the whole way. And Jorn thought, I'm going to sacrifice a pawn. I'm going to play for action. Um, and I, I, want, I want an imbalanced position. So after g4 here, Magnus goes for it. He takes on e4. Probably the only only choice, by the way, because if you don't take this knight on e4, black will eventually go knight g5, and there's knight f3 or knight h3 here. And black is definitely doing very well because of the weaknesses on the light squares. The pawn on g4 in particular supports these knight jumps to f3 or to h3 here. So g4 is played, so Magnus takes. Now Jordan takes with the f-pawn, gambiting a pawn. Jordan could have taken with a d-pawn to avoid losing material, but after, after d takes e4, white can now smash the center of the board with d5. And now the concept of the rook placement is really, really important here because after pawn takes, pawn takes, pawn takes, white can go rook c5. And now the rooks being on the c and the d file are placed optimally. And there's also going to be a lot of pressure on the fifth rank as well. Let me just make a move. Like say h6, rook d5, f5 is weak, a5 is weak, and white is completely winning in this position. So Jordan does not go for this correctly. Instead, he takes with the f pawn. So after f takes e4, Queen takes g4 is played, and now Jordan plays queen e8. Now you'll notice that in this position, white has one extra pawn. White has this extra f2 pawn. At the same time, black has a really, really good grip on the center. He has a sort of this triangle and this connect four in the center. White can never really push this f pawn, so this f2 point is always going to be a weakness. And additionally, black can play for something like, let me make some random moves, king g2, rook f3, king g1. I'm just making moves to illustrate a point. Queen f7, king g2, and after black gets a legendary triple stack here on the f file, there's a lot of pressure long term. I'll just make a few more moves to illustrate the other point. Um, let's say black gets a bishop to h6. There's a lot of lot of pressure here towards f2 and e3 for um, for for black. So that is the long term plan. So even though black has sacrificed a pawn, white can't really do a whole lot with these pawns on the king side. So I really really like the uh, I like the idea from Jordan. I think it's a very original concept. And I do not consider it to be a blunder. And I like the way he did it because I think he was saying, you know what, Magnus, I'm going to go after you. I'm going to try to beat you. Show no fear. So anyway, Magnus takes on d5. Again, white can't really do a whole lot on the king's side. So because of that, white really needs to shift the focus back over towards the queen side with things like b4, or a4, or try to open up the c file. So e takes d5 is played by Jordan. Of course, you do not take the c pawn because if you take with the c pawn, now after rook c7, rook f7, rook c1, now the extra pawn will play because white controls the open file, and long term, there are going to be some exchanges of rooks off the board. So e takes d5 is played here, and now rook to c5 is played by Magnus, trying to attack this pawn on a5. Again, if black can get an optimal setup with like rook f3, queen f7, and rook f8, then black is fine, but black still it's still going to be a little bit of time before black can get to that sort of position. So h5 is played here to attack the queen on g4. 
Magnus plays queen h3. Jordan plays queen f7. Of course, white cannot take the pawn on a5 because after rook a5, rook a5, bishop takes a5. The, the, the base of the chain falls. There's queen takes f2. And after king h1, queen f3, we have a mini pyramid of Giza, and the rook on d1 is going to be lost. So here, queen to g2 is played by Magnus. And now a4 is played by Jordan, and Magnus goes b4 correctly. And at this point, I was already getting very optimistic for Magnus because I felt that he could play b5, open up the c file, and start to attack. Um, a, he can attack the pawn chain with b5. He can weaken this connect forward here. And additionally, he can try to rip open the c file and, and stack his rooks. So after b4, queen d7 is played here by Jordan. Magnus goes pawn to b5, and Jordan correctly plays h4. He decides, you know what, I have to try to start doing something on the king's side, because otherwise, eventually, I'm going to get run over on the queen side. White has rook c1 here. Maximum pressure on the connect four. There's also, again, the open file. So Jordan plays h4, and I really, really like this move. Again, showing no fear and trying to take the battle to Magnus here. Another reason that I really like this decision by Jordan, even if objectively it might be a little bit unsound, is that when he plays this, he's actually going after Magnus as king. And one thing about Magnus is that he really likes king safety. King safety is at a premium for Magnus, and he does not like being attacked. So I really do like, uh, I, I really do like this, uh, this approach from Jordan. So h4, rook dc1 is played here by Magnus. Again, trying to put more pressure on the pawn on c6. Now Jordan plays rook f6. Correct move. Again, you do not want to take the pawn. Material is even here. But after rook c7, now you're going to have problems on the 7th rank. Additionally, if like queen e6, white can even maybe take on h4 and attack the bishop on g7, and white is completely winning. The rook f6 is played here by Jordan. Magnus trades the pawns on c6, and now Magnus plays g4. Now, this is a very committal move, but I think this, this is sort of a signal that Magnus was feeling a little bit uncomfortable here, because to me, it felt like this, is, this, this could create some weaknesses, and it feels like if you go rook b1 and maybe rook a5, you have some play here. Uh, but when Magnus plays g4, it's a very clear sign that he's, he's very worried about this king side attack. And this is also why I have to stress, and I can't stress enough, when people only look at the computer engine and they see a move like g4 that was played by Jordan, they'll think, oh, that's a blunder. But, it's, but you can't solely look at the evaluation because we are not computers at the end of the day. So after g4 h3 is played by Jordan. Of course, you don't really want white to get h3, because say you play rook g6 and h3, the king side is actually very safe now for white, because you can't attack this pawn on g4. Getting to this pawn on h3 even is very tough here. For example, say I go rook g1, rook f3, rook a5, it's still very hard. Both these pawns are very secure, and you can't really attack the pawn on h3 any, with any other piece here. So instead, Jorn plays h3, which is, again, another move that I'm a big fan of. Even if the computer doesn't love it, I really like it because, again, it destabilizes the position. Now there's going to be an open h file as well, and so it's going to be very hard for white to guard both the pawns on g4 and h2 and or if it's on h3. The rook af8 is played by Jordan. Magnus goes queen g2. Again, trying to get the optimal setup with the pawn on h3 to guard g4. But now one thing you'll notice is that after rook g6, um, let's say white plays h3, now you can play rook f3, followed by rook h6, and you can attack the pawn on h3, and then g4 also becomes weak. Now, if we contrast this with the previous position that we were at, uh, right, right, up, um, right up here, you'll notice that the pawn on h4, it actually stops all the black threats. You cannot get at this pawn on h3 because this pawn on h4 stops it, whereas without the pawn on h4, as we see, as we see in this position, Black can go rook h6 and attack. So that pawn does nothing but get in the way. So even though it's a pawn and material matters, sometimes sacrificing material is important to open up, open up the lines for the, the heavy, heavy, heavy pieces or the artillery, in this case, the rooks on f3 and g6. So Magnus plays g5 instead of h3. Now I will note that it, those of you guys who are using computers will note that the computer actually likes rook h6 followed by rook f3 a little bit more. Again, this is a game between two humans, so I'm not going to go into depth on all these different variations, uh, but I feel that rook g6 is a much more human move. So after rook g6, g5 is played here by Magnus. Now, when Magnus plays g5, he's basically saying, I don't think that I can play h3 and keep the setup and hold it together. So he basically decides, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go g5, and the idea is to play h4, guard g5, and or play h5. Additionally, if you get a position like this, for example, you'll notice you can't actually attack anything. The rook on g6 is stuck. Pawn guards h6, and additionally, you can't really target the pawn on h4 either here. So after g5, Jordan plays rook f5 to attack the pawn on, f5, on g5. 
h4 is played by magnus and now jordan plays bishop f8 to attack the rook now one thing i was surprised by and i know this is the best computer move with um rook c2 is i thought that rook a5 trying to infiltrate and use these two rooks here for example just just to highlight the point um something like bishop d6 rook b1 you now have two open files for your rooks i felt that this was maybe a little bit more um more human or a little bit more natural to try and create counter chances on the queen side rather than what magnus does in the game here with rook c2 by playing rook c2 here he still has ideas to double stack but again the, the thing with rook c2 is you're never really going to be able to attack this king so trying to go rook b2 and rook c rook b2 and rook b1 is going to take quite a bit of time so i was a little bit little bit surprised by this um again rook c2 is a completely reasonable move in fact i think the computer likes it um but i felt that rook a5 to try and create counter chances maybe um to me at least it felt like maybe an, an easier e easier option um Anyway, Bishop e7 is played here by Jordan. Now Magnus goes rook b2. And Jordan here is in a lot of trouble, potentially. He's down two pawns here on the king's side. And if he doesn't do something fast, let's say white can go rook b1 and rook b8 or rook b7, you're going to lose the game instantly. So now Jordan, Jordan takes on g5. Now, in retrospect, this is actually just losing. And is, again, there's no criticism whatsoever, really, of the players here. Both players are getting low on time. Uh, but if you don't do this, you're going to lose anyway, probably. So he, he decides to basically uh, sort of bluff or, or gamble here by taking on g5 and trust that Magnus will not be able to find the right continuation. Um, now here, Magnus plays king f1, which is a very important move. You do not take on g5, because after rook g5, you're losing the game. Additionally, it's worth noting, however, that black could have also played rook takes g5 here. And after h takes g5, rook g5, this would have also been more than enough for black uh, to avoid losing, so after queen g5, bishop g5, white goes king f1, and now you can simply play a move like, like, um, let's see, there are a couple options here, but I would say even something like queen f5 here, to hit the pawn at e3, you also have queen h3 or queen f3, and black should be okay. So after rook b2, Jorn does not do that, does not take with a rook. Again, I think Jorn probably felt that, sure, he could get a draw with rook takes g5, but he wanted to try for more. He wanted to go for glory. He wanted to make the Dutch people proud. A win for win for the Dutch over, over the Norwegians would, would have been huge for history. So instead, he plays bishop takes g5 here. Magnus goes king f1. Again, you cannot move the bishop here because then you would lose the rook on g6. Jorn plays queen a7. A very logical move here. You want to basically stop the king from running all the way over to the queen side here. And now you want to go queen a6. And it was in this position that getting relatively low on time, Magnus makes a big mistake. He chooses not to play king e2. And I don't know whether he saw the boogeyman or what exactly he missed in this line. But after king to e2, queen to a6, king to d1, white is in fact winning now because the king is very safe on d1. And you're going to be able to capture the bishop on g5. And you'll just be ahead by one piece. And with the king being super safe, black really won't have chances to create counterplay. However, here Magnus very oddly does not do that. Instead, he plays the move queen g4. Now, I'm going to assume that this move was Magnus low on time, calculating, and he, he missed he missed Jorn's, um, Jorn's next plan with queen a6 here, because otherwise queen g4 doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So queen a6 is played, and now Magnus used, I think, his final couple of minutes to play this move king to g1. I strongly suspect that Magnus's original intention was to play rook e2 here, but I think he missed that there's this very tricky move, queen to c8, guards the rook on f5. Additionally, if white tries to take the bishop here, there's now rook takes f2, and this is a clean discovered attack after rook f2, queen g4. Black is winning here. So I suspect that Magnus missed this. There was another option, which is queen to e2 here, but again, after queen to c8, let's say you take on g5, Rook takes g5. This gets very scary. The stack is coming down. There's rook g1. Your king is kind of open. Additionally, with the queen on c8, it's really perfectly placed for queen h3 and a6. So say you go queen, queen c2 here. The idea is to run the king out. Like rook g1, you go king, king e2, king d2. But if you go queen c2, I can actually throw in the check first. Cut your escape square. And then after queen e2, I have rook to g1 checkmate. So at this point, it's really, really tricky. And Magnus, to his credit, still finds a good continuation with king to g1 and now jorn plays rook g7 which is an excellent move here the idea being that in this position you'd love to move the bishop out of the way like bishop d8 but after queen g6 you lose the game but after rook g7 now you do threaten to move the bishop because your king guards the rook on g7 and if white takes on f5 you go bishop f4 discovered check on the king and after king h1 you go queen to f1 checkmate and white is simply 
done and not just not just in the game or in Vikonze. So instead, Magnus plays Rook B8. Another very, very good move, by the way, here. And maybe not the absolute best move, but a very pr good practical decision because now Magnus gets into an end game where he can never lose. So Rook to B8 is played here. Bishop D8 blocks the check, and now the Queen on G4 is pinned. Magnus takes on D8. Jordan plays Rook F8. There's a trade on F8. And now here, White's going to lose the Queen for the Rook, but when you look at the pawn structure, all the pawns are on the opposite color here. So as long as White can get Bishop B4 and A3, White will be able to create a fortress, even though Magnus doesn't believe in fortresses. So Bishop B4, King to G8 is played. Queen takes G7, King G7, A3. And now you'll notice the Bishop guards the pawn, pawn guards the Bishop. And with these opposing pawn chains here on the opposite color, neither side can really do a whole lot. So King G6, King G2, King to H5 played by Jorn, trying to bring the king in. In an endgame, the king can be an attacking piece as well. Rook to h1 played by Magnus. And here Jordan plays a great move that just kills the game on the spot and does not give Magnus any chances to keep the game going. He plays the brilliant move c5. Sacrificing a pawn here. I think this is his third pawn sacrifice in the game. First he sacked a pawn on g4, then he sacked a pawn on h3, and now he makes a third pawn sacrifice on c5. And this is an extremely good move because if white could ever, let me just make some random moves, if white could ever get the setup with like bishop e7, queen a8, rook g3, there is some potential for white to maybe go rook g5, h5, and create some winning chances, a la Magnus's endgame against Nepo. Sure, that was a rook and knight versus queen versus rook and bishop, but maybe some chances to play for the win. So after c5 is played here, Magnus has to take the pawn, and now there's queen g6. And if you go king to h3 or king to h2, it's still a draw here, but you feel a little bit weird giving up this pawn at h4. Magnus plays king f1 instead, and after queen a6, he finally concedes that he cannot play for the win here. If he plays king to e1, after this move queen to d3, it's still a draw because white can set up a fortress with rook h3, but again, white can never win this position. Say king g4, the fortress would be rook g3, king h4, Bishop b4, and now white can just basically wait forever, just shuffling the bishop between b4 and c5. And if you check, there's always going to be a shuffle between e2 and e1. There are two shuffles here, and both of them lead to a draw, and everything is guarded. However, Magnus doesn't really see any reason to try and play on. He goes king g2, and after queen g6, king f1, queen a6, he goes back to g2, and the players agree to a peaceful draw. Again, the result ends up being peaceful, but this was a very, very instructive game for many reasons. I think most importantly... Um, it highlights the advanced concepts that you see at the top level where material is important, but playing for the initiative and making sacrifices is really, really important. Um, and it's again, it follows that rule that it follows the, the theme of you learn a thousand rules in the game of chess and you learn when to break them. Obviously, when when you're instructing lower rated players, you tell them that you you basically you don't want to sacrifice material generally. You want to make sure that you don't make these sorts of sacrifices or blunders. Um, but at the higher level, you learn where you can make sacrifice, whether it's a pawn, whether it's a piece, and you learn to break the rules. So it's really, really this is really sh highlights the um the advanced concepts that do occur in these top level games. All right, you guys, this is going to be the end of our recap, and we are going to get ready for Tilted Tuesday. So I am going to go. Um, wait one second.